coastline of Wisconsin's um, the coastline of Wisconsin's Great Lakes is constantly changing due to the physical and hydrologic processes impacting the coast. Um, water levels on the Great Lakes are also dynamic. These fluctuations can occur across different time scales. Um, we have water level changes seasonally due to impacts of precipitation and evaporation, and they also vary um, interannually um, over longer time scales. So in recent memory, uh, Lake Michigan quickly re reached record high uh, water levels after experiencing record low water levels in 2013, just seven years earlier. Um, low water levels and high water levels have distinct impacts on the coastline. Um, as many of us are familiar with, high water levels can exacerbate erosion and flooding hazards on Lake Michigan. Um, on the screen, I have a pretty dramatic example of that. These pictures show how um, the rapid erosion of a homeowner's bluff in southeastern Wisconsin um, from the most recent swing from low to high water levels. Um, and this rapid erosion uh, caused bluff failure, which caused their porch to fall over the edge. And um, unfortunately, the house uh, foundation was exposed and it had to be demolished. Um, from, for those of you who are from southeastern Wisconsin, you may remember a winter storm in January of 2020 when water levels were high. Uh, millions of dollars of damage were caused to beaches, bluffs, coastal infrastructure. Um, and then in the Green Bay area, uh, the effects of high water level caused just a normal sized storm um, to have severe flooding uh, impacts uh, in the Bay Area. And so because of um, the dynamic nature of the coast, there's an ongoing need to increase community capacity to address these enduring coastal hazards. Um, there are a lot of entities in Wisconsin working together to build coastal resilience in our Lake Michigan coastal communities. Uh, starting with a small group in 2015, Wisconsin Sea Grant led an integrated assessment of changing Lake Michigan water levels and their impacts on coastal bluffs and beaches in southeastern Wisconsin. The integrated assessment, as well as other multi-stakeholder um, assessments in the region, identified specific needs to enhance coastal resilience in three key areas. And those were um, the prediction and mapping of shoreline uh, erosion and bluff failure, um, the communication of risks and actions, and um, guidance and facilitation on collaborative regional actions. Um, in 2018, the Southeastern Wisconsin Coastal Resilience Project um, took the momentum from the integrated assessment to develop this project working towards collaborative regional actions. So the project was successful in forming and engaging the Southeastern Wisconsin Coastal Resilience Community of Practice, um, as well as providing mapping and risk communication resources. Um, during the same time frame, there were more regional resilience projects and efforts taking off in the Green Bay and Northeast Wisconsin coastal communities. And so this brings us to the present. Um, in 2021, the Collaborative Action for Lake Michigan Coastal Resilience, or CALM, which is way easier to say, um, was funded by a NOAA Projects of Special Merit Grant to expand the risk communication framework um, that was established by the Southeastern Wisconsin Coastal Resilience Project um, to those uh, Wisconsin, Green Bay, and Northeastern communities. Um, and this was to regionally prioritize and address coastal hazards. And so that's why we're all here today. Um, for those of you who I haven't met, my name is Lydia Salas and I'm the project coordinator for CALM. Um, I come from a background in ecological restoration and water resources management in the Great Lakes region. And I'm really excited to continue working with the Great Lakes on this project. And I'm also very excited um, to be able to meet you all and work with you all over the next year. So um, CALM has three key goals and um, it's based on this understanding that there's value to having 
both local efforts in the region, but also collaboration across it. Um, and so that's really where this network comes in. So it will serve, Calm will serve to add structure to the communication between coastal resilience efforts um, by allowing groups to collaborate with each other, share information, um, and work on hazard reduction goals together. So the three main goals here on the screen are, are first to increase collaboration and capacity to address coastal hazards. Um, second, to help develop, revise, or adopt ordinances, plans, and policies that incorporate coastal resilience. And third, to um, regionally prioritize hazards to address through collaborative action. So we plan to work on these goals in a few ways. Um, first, by building and regularly meeting with this CALM network. Um, so we conducted a planning survey to more than 350 potential stakeholders um, this winter. Many of you participated in that and it was very helpful to us. And the results of that survey, which I'll share with you in a little bit, um, will help guide how we facilitate this network and engage with you all. Um, we will also continue updating and maintaining the Wisconsin Coastal Resilience uh, website and newsletter. Um, the link to the website is being added to the chat. And um, some of you may be familiar with the Southeastern Wisconsin Coastal Resilience Project website. Um, it houses a lot of great coastal resilience content and resources, and we have been working to expand the scope of that website to Wisconsin's entire Lake Michigan um, shoreline. Um, Lake Superior may also find it <laughs> value in the site, um, but this week we just transitioned from the old domain to a new domain, so now it is just um, Wisconsin Coastal Resilience. And um, the website is active and accessible, um, but there are still some behind the, behind the scenes construction taking place. So if you notice anything, let us know, but we're also working to kind of work out those kinks. Um, some key features of the website include profiles on organizations and networks working on coastal resilience in the Lake Michigan region. And we're hoping that that helps clarify who's doing what. Um, there's a lot of work going on and it's fantastic that there's so much work, but it can be a little bit confusing. So hopefully this provides a little bit of clarity. Um, there's also going to be collection of funding opportunities for coastal resilience related work, tools and resource highlights, case studies of local initiatives working to enhance coastal resilience, um, in Wisconsin and throughout the Great Lakes. And then there's also a blog section. And so we will be continually developing content and making updates to this website. Um, so as I mentioned, um, with CALM, we're trying to bring Wisconsin's Lake Michigan region together. Um, within Wisconsin's 11 Lake Michigan coastal counties, there are 18 cities, 16 villages, 36 towns, and beyond that, there are countless agencies, organizations, and networks working within these communities. Um, this includes you know, planners, zoning administrators, coastal managers, parks departments, emergency managers, locally elected officials, clerks, state and federal agencies, academic institutions, nonprofits, I could go on. Um, present at today's events, we have stakeholders from each of these sectors um, that will be you know, popping in and out throughout the meeting today. Um, and over the next year, we will be providing opportunities for you all to share um, lessons learned and leverage one another's work. One way that we wanna try to do this is through our monthly Coastal Resilience Newsletter. Some of you um, already received this newsletter uh, but for those of you that don't, on a monthly basis, we share highlights, um, including water level updates, funding and training opportunities, events, um, tools and resources, and case studies. And something that we are going to pilot in future newsletters um, will be a collaboration classifieds section. Um, and in this section, you will be able to submit opportunities that you have 
um, to collaborate with other communities, organizations, or networks. Um, and it will also be a platform um, to ask your fellow Lake Michigan stakeholders for resources, input, or experience. Um, so like I said, we'll be piloting it uh, next month and we'll see how it goes. We'd love to get feedback from you on that um, as, as, we, as we incorporate it. Um, so I introduced myself, but I also want to mention the partners supporting this effort. Um, CALM would not be a collaborative network without a little collaboration on the other side of the curtain. Um, the Wisconsin Coastal Management Program, the State Cartographer's Office, our State Geogra Geographic Information Officer, and Wisconsin Sea Grant are all providing their expertise, experience, and resources to CALM. Um, my contact information is here on the slide, but we'll also put it in the chat for you. This project is also guided by a steering committee made up of representatives from local communities, state and federal agencies, sewage districts, academic institutions, and regional planning commissions and more. So essentially, those of you who are here with us, we have representatives um, who are helping guide this project. So before we hear from our presenters today, I wanted to provide a bit of context that is driving what, will we, what we'll focus on through this network. Um, this winter, like I said, a planning survey was sent out to CALM stakeholders um, to identify content that would meet their resilience needs and priorities, um, what potential CALM members could share with this community, um, and then also preferred meeting types and communication styles. We had nearly 125 responses, and I just wanted to share a few of the top results from um, the survey. So one of the questions that we asked was, what coastal hazards are a concern or interest to you? And the top three hazards of concern were erosion, infrastructure vulnerability, and lake level fluctuation. Um, another question that we asked were, are there any topics or issues where you want more in-depth training or support? And the top three responses for this question were coordinated shoreline protection efforts, resilience funding, and engineered approaches to shoreline protection. Another question I wanted to highlight is, um, what tools, resources do you want from the CALM network? And the top three answers here were funding opportunities and how to prepare for them, lessons learned from other communities and projects, and updates about ongoing projects, efforts, and collaborations in the region. And then the final question I wanted to share with you that we asked was what you would like to hear from your fellow network members. And the responses here were opportunities for collaborative projects, funding sources used specifically for policy and planning projects, and enhancing the coastal hazard component of comprehensive and hazard mitigation plans. So based on these responses, we're gonna be curating content, we're gonna be asking speakers, we're gonna be formulating meetings, um, and hopefully, um, you know, more local meetings, not just um, virtual meetings. So this is fantastic to have everyone join us today. Um, but based on your responses, you know, we're building a collaborative network here. And you told us in this survey question, in the survey questions that collaboration was a top priority for you. So we want to do, we want to know exactly what collaboration means or looks like to you in the context of resilience work in the Lake Michigan region. And so to start a conversation about this, we're going to have a quick interactive activity. Um, it's also hard to have a collaborate, collaborative network um, if you don't have the opportunity to meet and talk. So this will be our first introduction to each other. Um, we're going to break out into rooms of three people and we will have three minutes to answer three questions. Um, so three minutes will go fast, but um, please introduce yourselves, talk briefly about um, what experiences or expertise you think you can bring to this group to help work towards resilience goals. Um, but what we're most interested in getting your responses about today is about this question of what collaboration means to you related to coastal resilience work. 
um, you know, you can be talk through examples or if you have some specifics, anything like that. And when we come back to the main room, um, it would be fantastic if you could share your responses to the collaboration question in the chat. So Adam um, is going to break us out into rooms now and you guys will have the opportunity to introduce yourselves. Um, everyone was muted and um, video was turned off when they came into the meeting. So make sure that you unmute yourselves and turn your video on when you join your breakout room. So Adam, go for it. Here we go. We have to click join. Yeah, there should be a pop up that that tell that gives you the option to join. Welcome back, everyone. So it, it says that breakouts are closing in 40 seconds. So okay, so some might just minute. be joining. Yeah. Okay. Well, for those of you who are back, feel free to start typing your answers in the chat to what you talked about, what collaboration means or looks like to you in this coastal resilience field. They're going to close in about 10 seconds. Okay. And Adam, can I just confirm that my PowerPoint's still showing? It is. Yep. Okay. So I'll, I'll kind of flow in back. There we go. I'm starting to see more people. All right, everyone, as you come back, start adding your answers to the chat about what you discussed that collaboration means or looks like to you in this coastal resilience field. Could be a minute to fill in your answers. Um, so feel free to add them in the chat. I'm seeing some come in, um, networking, sharing information, planning and implementing on a watershed scale. Leveraging multidisciplinary expertise, using all available resources learning about what other people are doing to align your efforts, sharing knowledge, joint grant applications. These are great. So keep them coming. Um, your answers are gonna be so helpful to us as we coordinate this network. Um, and also as you know, we work together in this community. So yes, please keep sharing. This is fantastic. Um, we're going to kick off Calm today with a really great set of topics and resources and um, opportunities to start thinking collaboratively and taking advantage of resources and occasions um, to help build resilience in this region. Um, so we will have two sets of speakers this morning, followed by a Q&A section where you can have the opportunity to ask our speakers some questions. So, with that, I want to introduce, before I introduce my first speaker, I'm sorry, I just wanted to go over some um, Zoom best practices. Um, so I know everyone's using different platforms these days um, and it might be a little bit confusing. So if you're unfamiliar with Zoom, um, there is a toolbar where you can um, unmute yourself or mute yourself start your video um, in your participants 
setting. If you go to participants and more, you can change your name um, if you'd like to. Um, in the reaction section, there is a raise hand feature, which you might want to use during the Q&A period. Um, and in the three dots where it signifies the more section, um, you can uh, put the chat up on your screen so that you can see it side by side with um, the videos and presentations today. Um, so while we have our presenters speaking, please turn um, your mics off and your videos off to help with bandwidth. Um, but during the Q&A portion, um, if you would like to unmute yourself and ask a question and turn on your video um, while you're speaking, that's great, totally fine. Um, otherwise, during the Q&A portion, feel free to use the chat raise hand feature. Okay, so um, without further ado, I will introduce our first speaker, which is who is Tori Graves. Tori is a U.S. Policy Advisor for the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence Cities Initiative. Um, and today she'll be sharing an overview of their coastal resilience programming pertaining to Wisconsin's communities. Um, and also just trying to help clarify a little bit about what's going on in the region. So Tori, I'm gonna pass it off to you. Awesome, thanks Lydia. Thanks for having us out this morning. So nice to see a good turnout. There's quite a few people on here and a lot of familiar faces. So if you've already heard some of this information, it's just a little refresher and for those who we haven't met yet, excited to share this information with you all. Um, as Lydia said, I'm Tori Graves. I'm with the Cities Initiative. I just started last spring, so coming up on a year here, so I might still be a new face to some of you. Um, and then today I'm also joined by two of my colleagues, Matt Doss, who's our US Policy Director, and our newest team member, Bridget Brown. She's our Special Programs Director, and she's actually located in Milwaukee, so great to have some Wisconsin representation on team. And then, as Lydia said, today I'm going to talk about some of our recent work that we've been pushing forward to advance coastal resilience across the basin, and then particularly some of our programming with Wisconsin's Lake Michigan communities. So with that, we can go ahead and kick off to the next slide. All right, so just a refresher on who we are as an organization. The Cities Initiative was formed uh, back in 2003 by the former mayors of Chicago and Toronto. And they got together and really felt like this was an awesome initiative to take, get all these mayors together and focus on the Great Lakes. So over the years, the group's actually grown to become a binational coalition of about, um, we're actually, I think, closer to 135 mayors now across the US and Canada. And you can see a lot of them on the map here, and this is still growing. So I think we're missing some on the map as well. As an organization, we aim to advance the protection and restoration of the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence River by convening local governments, specifically through those mayors. So that's kind of what makes us different and unique from other organizations. And through this membership, we focus on elevating local perspectives and working that up the chain to, to have a broader impact at a binational level and across the basin. So influencing policies and processes and programs and leveraging our mayors in that space. So over the years, we've covered a lot of major issues pertaining to the Great Lakes, including um, your big ticket items, things like ecological restoration, invasive species, water withdrawals, um, but a big part of being a, a group working in the Great Lakes field, as you all know, is being nimble and able to adjust to the most pressing, pressing issues facing um, communities in the basin. And again, our focus is on cities. So what issues are cities facing? And with this in mind, our main focus has shifted in recent years to cover um, COVID relief, water equity, water infrastructure funding, and coastal resilience, which I'll, of course, be talking about today. Um, so we can go on to the next slide. And as you all know, um, coastal, hazard, coastal hazards have been placing a heavy burden on uh, communities and cities across the basin. And as an organization, our goal is to help municipalities in their endeavors to become more resilient. And so over the past year, through kind of our organizational model, thinking about mayors and cities, we've been building out a program um, to address these challenges. And so, the first priority area, which is up on the screen here, is research. And so we really want to aim to utilize science and research as a foundation for our work. Um, that'll really help guide uh, science-minded policies and programs that will have ultimately you know, the best and most resilient outcomes. And one way we've contributed to this 
is by conducting a coastal resilience needs assessment survey last spring um, in partnership with the University of Illinois. And this is something we actually hope to begin conducting annually. So stay tuned for more on this. We'll definitely want to kind of get some input from Wisconsin communities as well to start mapping out any additional needs and trends that are happening over time in the coastal space. So then building on research, if you give another click, Lydia, you'll see we have this next step over our um, strategy. So research is the foundation, then we kind of balloon out into our strategy. And the element that really fills in this piece for us is our Mayor's Advisory Council on Coastal Resilience. So this advisory council is led by coastal mayors who are members in our organization, but we also have a lot of other regional coastal partners, uh, field experts, people from academia, all coming together to develop a suite of recommendations over the last year. So those were just approved um, earlier this month and we'll have a report coming out in the, in the coming weeks actually to, which will really help launch us in the year ahead to start creating action plans and taking steps towards some of these broader recommendations that will ultimately help coastal communities build out their resilience. Um, then if you go to the next one, we have a couple layers of um, more of our on the ground components to kind of implement our strategy. So first we remain active in advocating for policies that facilitate greater coastal resilience and expand uh, some of those bigger funding pots, federal resources, uh, working with federal agencies to really make sure that those resources are supporting, supporting the local level. Then the next one, we also have um, been engaging with groups, um, you know, thinking like Calm and others to stay up to date on what other people are doing, how we can work together. And then also another component of our program is hosting different educational webinars geared towards um, cities, municipalities, and our mayors. And then finally, we've been working with um, local communities to boost development of coastal resilience projects through our Resilient Coastal Projects Initiative, which I'll be focusing on more uh, for the rest of the presentation. So we can go ahead and talk more about that on the next slide. So the Resilient Coastal Projects Initiative, in a nutshell, is focused on working with municipalities to identify coastal projects and develop what we're calling implementation frameworks for getting those projects funded. So it doesn't include the engineering design work, but it's really about what types of resources can we harness to fund the projects to the next phase that they need to go to. So the initiative started last year when we received a grant from the Fund for Lake Michigan to work in Wisconsin's Lake Michigan coastal communities. So that's really sort of our pilot program here. We also got a separate grant from the Herb Foundation to expand to Southeast Michigan. So that one's just behind our Wisconsin pilot. And then more recently, we received a larger grant from the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation uh, late last year to expand this work across the basin. So this is really gonna become a basin-wide program with um, all of your communities as a pilot. So this is really exciting for us. And it's been a really great place to to do the pilot because there's such a great um, community of partners and, and cities doing a lot of work in this area. So this has been really great for our pilot. And then I also wanna recognize Stantec who has been our primary technical consultant so far on this work. So for the next slide, um, to kind of go into a little bit more of what our program focuses on, we've got a lot of questions about what types of projects does the, does the program support? And we've tried to be a little flexible on this because we know that a lot of coastal projects aren't necessarily all directly on the shoreline, right? There's some impacts up um, a little bit inland in that coastal zone that could still be impacting um, coastal outcomes and resilience. So these projects could include things that address um, shoreline stabilization and erosion, which is a big one that we've been seeing, but also things like coastal flooding, stormwater management, um, water infrastructure or other critical infrastructure in the coastal zone, um, and then habitat and natural feature, feature restoration. And through our pilot program, we've really seen quite a variety of projects. So pretty much I think touching on all of these categories here, as well as some highlights on different benefits through um, recreation and tourism and waterfront revitalization. So thinking about those added benefits of, of doing coastal projects and how do we make them really holistic resilient and providing benefits for the whole community. Um, and then again, our priority is to have um, participating communities 
really kind of guide what the challenges are in their community on the ground. So this one isn't really a one size fits all approach for the communities that are participating in this work. So you can go ahead to the next slide and I can walk us through some of the phases that we've taken through our pilot and this will serve as a kind of a template for the other areas that we'll be expanding to over the next year. So the first uh, step, which is really important for us is prioritizing that relationship building phase. And this includes organizing an advisory team. So we've got about, I think 20 plus members on an advisory team for our Wisconsin Lake Michigan communities. And this was really a critical step because we work at such a large scale, but it's important for us to still stay grounded in the voices of those working at more of a local or sub-regional scale. Then once we formed the advisory team, we worked to identify a list of cities that would be invited to participate. And um, while we'd love to support everyone along the lakeshore, obviously there are some limitations. So we had to think through that step critically. And then we started working um, more one-on-one -on -one with the communities and establishing relationships with city staff, again, leveraging our member mayors to get some political will behind projects. And then, um, the goal is to do kind of sort of a first big laundry list of identifying coastal projects in the area and then ultimately narrowing in that list um, doing a review of coastal data to ultimately identify one project per community that would go through a the kind of the scoping for that implementation framework so each community will ultimately end with a final polished product that they can take to go get their project funded um, and ideally kind of thinking big here. So how can we, you know, leverage a lot of the federal dollars that are coming through um, in the coming years. So on the next slide, I can walk through some of our progress updates with the, um, with the Wisconsin pilot. So first, just kind of some of the statistics that I like to share to quantify some of the work that we've been doing. Um, the first is that we have about 12 participating communities and you can see along the map here that we're pretty well distributed across, across the shoreline. And then to support this work, we have, like I said, about 20 local and regional partners on our advisory team who are helping to guide this process and be close partners um, with us, with the cities. And then in our first pass of asking these communities to identify priority coastal projects, we actually got about 60 project sites uh, or ideas that could be advanced through the process. So of course we can't advance 60 projects. And so we're at the phase where we just recently hosted some one-on-one uh, -on -one conversations with communities to prioritize their projects. And we've narrowed that down to about 20 projects now across the 12 communities. And so our next step, um, if you go to the next, uh, click one more and there'll be some more text that shows up there. Thank you. Um, you can go back one, <laughs> thanks. So for the next step, we'll be working with our partners at Stantec to really do a deeper dive and analyze the different sites that are being proposed, looking at what hazards are in the area. And then um, we'll start working on developing those implementation frameworks and hopefully have that all wrapped up by the fall. And then we can go to the last slide and wrap up here with a really important note that I wanted to mention. Um, as you all know, there's a lot of groups in this space working to advance coastal resilience in Wisconsin, and a really key and valuable part of our work has been working closely with other local and sub-regional partners um, to strategically align our programs so that the communities can capitalize on the different opportunities available to them, specifically thinking about technical support for projects. And with that said, we've started working more closely with a number of groups and meeting on a regular basis to align our, our resources that we have available through different funders. And I wanna recognize all of those on the slide here. Um, I know this list is not inclusive, but um, I see some folks who are on the call today and just wanna thank everyone for their leadership and collaboration. Um, and just noting that the city's initiative is certainly only one kind of small piece of this broader coastal puzzle. And so, um, you know, this collaboration is something we wanna carry forward in our other pilot, or not pilot, but our other regions that we'll be expanding to. And for that reason, we're really excited to see groups like Calm, and we were on the call yesterday with the Chaos Group, um, to think through how we can all be working together in this space and, and just making sure that we're 
really complementary in each other's efforts. So with that, I thank you again for having me. And I think we're doing questions later, correct? Yes. If you guys okay. have questions, feel free to throw them in the chat now. Um, but we will have a Q&A period um, in just a little bit where if you have any questions, you can direct them towards Tori. Awesome. Well, thanks so much. That's all I have for today. And we'll see if anyone has questions later. Great. Thank you so much, Tori. Really appreciate you being here. Um, so um, David Hart, the assistant director for Extension at Wisconsin Sea Grant was going to talk to us today about the Wisconsin Coastal Atlas and how it can be used as a resource to support coastal resilience. Um, unfortunately, something came up and he's unable to present this morning. So what I'm going to do is a brief overview of the Wisconsin Coastal Atlas for you today. Um, and then at a later point, we'll have David share a deeper dive um, either at a future meeting or maybe a recording that we post on the website. Um, and we'll make that available to you all. Um, and I know that he wants to get some feedback on the Atlas from you. So we'll also um, find a way to do that. Um, but like I said, I'm just gonna go through this quickly so that um, you can navigate the tool and use it to start finding resources. I'm going to take us here to the website. I think this will be um, easiest. And I'm just gonna stop my share real quick and make sure I'm on the right screen. Okay, can I just have a quick confirmation that you can all see the Wisconsin Coastal Atlas? Uh, I could, and now it's oh. the process of doing Oh, okay. How about now? Yes. Fantastic. Okay. So um, the Wisconsin Coastal Atlas is a resource hub. Um, it houses a variety of tools and resources and that provide decision support um, relevant to issues in Wisconsin. Um, there's something for everyone on this platform. Um, coastal re resource managers, planners, researchers, uh, educators, community members. Um, so I just want to um, give you a quick tour here. And so this is the landing page for the Wisconsin Coastal Atlas. Um, there are five different modules in the Atlas. Here you can see the cards for each module. Um, the modules are maps, tools, topics, um, catalog, and learn. And there's a sixth tile here. Um, this about tile is where you can get more information about the project team, the project partners, and also research um, about coastal web atlases. So let's visit the maps module first, just to kind of show you what you'll be getting into here. Um, the gallery contains interactive maps um, that help users explore coastal issues. So the, those are the types of maps that you'll find here. In each of the modules of the Atlas, um, there are two types of resources available, featured um, and searchable. So featured resources highlight prominent um, you know, widely used maps, tools, catalogs, or learning resources. Um, these are represented as these cards that you see here on the screen. Um, these cards contain a brief description of the resource as well as a link that will take you directly to the resource webpage, um, which you can see here. And then if you scroll to the bottom of the screen, um, you'll see this uh, search um, interface. And so the searchable resources can be found via this search interface at the bottom of the screen, at the bottom of each module. Um, so you can just type in your search here. Um, it can be organized a bit by category, um, and then it will populate the searchable resources below. Okay, now let's take a look at the tools section. Um, the tools module provides tools that help um, guide decisions about coastal management. And the distinction between 
um, maps and the tools modules in this atlas is that maps are more for exploration, while tools are for analysis and decision making. So you will see that each module is formatted the same way as we saw with the maps module. Um, featured resources are here at the top with these cards. And um, then down at the bottom of the page, you have searchable resources. Okay, I'm also just going to walk you through the catalog section. Um, this catalog module provides a pathway for you to find, assess, and download geospatial data relevant to Wisconsin's Great Lakes coasts. Um, for example, some of you may be familiar with Geodata at Wisconsin. This has a lot of geospatial data sets. Um, and this other card that you see here, Wisconsin Coastal Management Data Infrastructure, um, we will actually be hearing from them later this morning. Um, and so they are one of the resources here on the website in the catalog section. All right. So the next sec ne next module, excuse me, is um, the Learn module, which shares resources for place-based learning. Um, and as you can see with these cards up here, um, you know, impacts at Sheridan Park, um, Kenosha Dunes, um, the St. Louis River Estuary. There, these are all. Um, local issues really focused on place-based learning. Um, and there are links to all of their, um, direct links to all of them online. And finally, I want to take you to the topics module. Um, this module is modeled after um, the NOAA Digital Coast, um, which if you're unfamiliar is another great online resource hub. Um, and so the topics included in this module are Great Lakes water levels, um, flooding, bluff erosion, ports, harbors, and marinas, beaches, Green Bay, um, and nearshore freshwater habitats. For those of you who have visited the Atlas before, the um, Great Lakes water levels topic here at the top is actually new. Um, so I encourage you to check it out. Uh, each topic has a brief description, and we'll just take a quick look here at the Great Lakes Water Levels topic. Um, you can see that if you click View Topic, you're taken to a list of relevant resources that are grouped in different categories. So each topic's categories are a little bit different, um, but there will be a section kind of understanding the basics um, and then other uh, relevant resources, whether it's observations and forecasts or planning resources, um, assessment resources, uh, things like that. And so the last thing I want to point out with the Wisconsin Coastal Atlas um, is if you go to the menu, which is these four bars here on the um, upper right of the screen, um, there is a search bar here where um, you can type in buzzwords. So if you come to the Atlas and you're not quite sure what resource you're looking for, you know, feel free to type in your buzzwords here. I will just do an example. If we type in flood um, and you press search, what it does is it brings up all of the sections of the Atlas where flood is mentioned um, and you can browse through what shows up. So um, that's just a quick view of the Coastal Atlas. Um, David's contact information is going in the chat, and if you have any specific questions um, at this point for him, um, feel free to reach out, but hopefully we get that more in-depth dive of the Atlas to you soon. Um, and if you forget or lose the link to the Coastal Atlas, um, it's also avail um, linked on our Wisconsin Coastal Resilience website, um, so you can find it there listed in the Tools and Resources page. Okay, I'm going back to uh, sharing the screen here. Um, just give me one moment. All right, I think it's loading here. Perfect. Okay, so next we have um, time for a little Q&A. Um, 
Oh, excuse me, I'm sorry. Wisconsin Coastal Management Data Infrastructure is next. So I wanna introduce our next speaker, Jim Gillirano. Um, Jim is the State Geographic Information Officer for the Wisconsin Department of Administration. Um, Jim is currently working on the Wisconsin Coastal Management Data Infrastructure Project, known as WICTI. Um, and today he's going to discuss how this project can help incorporate existing sources of GIS, um, as well as build or modify data for coastal resilience projects. So Jim, feel free to unmute yourself and take it away. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, you got the screen up there. There she is. Okay, thank you, Lydia. Uh, Yes, I am the Geographic Information Officer for the state. I work at DOA and I sit next to the coastal management uh, folks uh, at DOA and we do a lot of interaction and uh, it's been a, a great collaboration, let me tell you. Um, also in this collaboration is Howard Verrigan, uh, the the UW State Cartographer's Office. He's the state cartographer. And uh, Genevieve Burgess is our uh, WICD uh, GIS analyst. And I think they're both on the call today. So next slide, please. Okay, so uh, WICD and CALM, what's, what's going on here? And uh, uh, it's kind of three sort of learning objectives here. Um, we're we're uh, we're here in uh, this capacity of trying to help uh, folks to find uh, the GIS data that they need for their resiliency projects, and it kind of goes without stating that a lot of uh, resilience projects need uh, GIS data. Uh, a lot of times that doesn't figure into some of the planning, and then you work you end up uh, scrambling at the end. So. Uh, for, for example, um, we have, um, uh, I, I do a lot of work with the, uh, the state's LIDAR program, uh, the LIDAR elevation program, and there's a lot of projects that are done, and that data is available, but there are also a lot of projects that are planned and in progress, and those are harder to deal with, those are harder to find, and, and so um, uh, it helps to have somebody to help navigate some of those things. Um, we can also help your project uh, with finding uh, experts, GIS experts for your project, uh, either uh, ones that are working uh, locally in the state or, or across the US. We, we have some contacts uh, all over the place. And then um, more directly, uh, because of our, our past involvement with uh, uh, projects of special merit, we, we have an ongoing project, which is collecting uh, culvert data inventories from local governments and uh, state DOT and various university and putting those all into one uh, sort of collective uh, uh, inventory uh, that helps to, to figure out what the, uh, the um, status of your, your culvert infrastructure is. And that in turn helps to create other hydrologic data, uh, stream networks, uh, hydro enforced DEMs, watershed models. So it's a really a, a, a very basic uh, starting point, uh, but it's also a very uh, important infrastructure layer that has a, has a lot of uh, uh, aspects of, of uh, needing um, uh, vulnerability modeling uh, in order to protect it uh, from climate change. Next slide, please. There we go. Okay, so so how this all got started, uh, we applied for two NOAA projects, special merit through the Coastal Management Program, and uh, uh, with our, our partners at the State Cartographer's Office, we were we were able to to get this off of the ground in the Lake Superior region. Uh, Besides the, uh, uh, the database, uh, there's also a, a sort of hazards commuting community of practice uh, that's grew up around this. And uh, the, the folks up in the Lake Superior region uh, uniquely have, have had to deal with 3,000 year rainfall events in the last 10 years, okay? And uh, this has caused some spectacular damage uh, to their infrastructure. 
particularly with culverts. So uh, the folks up there have been doing a lot of culvert inventories uh, over the past couple of years. And, and so this has really become uh, a, a focus uh, for, for activities, uh, mapping activities up there. So our little uh, culvert inventory of these various inventories uh, has around 30 data sets in it and probably around 300,000 points. And uh, it's not limited to just the Lake Superior region, but, it, but it's starting to uh, sort of spill over into other parts of the state and, and, and also sort of regionally the uh, uh, adjacent states as well. So uh, in, in the uh, COM project, we'll be, we'll be trying to uh, move this into the lake, uh, more into the Lake Michigan region and, and do a more active collect uh, of databases in that region. Next slide, please. Yeah, we missed one. There we go. Okay, so uh, so why am I talking here? Uh, GIS and resilience efforts. Um, pretty much any any kind of resilience effort effort, whether you're doing an ordinance or you're doing an application to a grant, you're going to need some kind of map, right? And the map needs data. So <clears throat> it kind of just goes without saying. And um, uh, and and if you know you're you're truly trying to make something that is data driven for, for the decision making. Uh, you, you really need to, to find out what the latest and the best data is. And if it doesn't exist, then figure out how you're going to create it. And, uh, you know, right now, uh, there's a lot of good stuff that's out there, but there's also a lot of stuff that's missing. And in particular, I would say what, what's really missing is the, the detailed stuff that's needed at the local level in order to do uh, very specific, um, uh, you know, analysis and monitoring. For example, the, you know, the, the bluffs, uh, uh, you know, falling into the lake, uh, you know, individual property level information. It, it's all kind of there, but it, it, it also needs some work to get it uh, into uh, uh, a working model. So WICD can help with that. Um, we have, uh, we have uh, experts in the watershed data, the culverts, the streams, the hydro enforced DEMs, uh, the state cartographer's office has a number of other experts. Uh, they run the parcel mapping program for the state. Uh, they're getting into structures, uh, building inventories. And of course, they've, they've done imagery projects through the years. And with the Robinson Map Library, uh, a lot of this data is available through uh, the geodata at Wisconsin. I put UW there, that's, that's wrong. Uh, geodata at Wisconsin. Um, we have the WICD Community of Practice, which has lots of uh, experts doing resiliency type work. Um, and there's also now a geospatial working group within WIKI, which is the Wisconsin Climate Change Impacts Group. And a, uh, in, a, <clears throat> in a very similar fashion, a lot of the stuff that those uh, WIKI working groups are working on needs data. And that has been a missing piece uh, of that uh, whole effort. So we're trying to get that uh, built into it. Um, and then, of course, uh, we, we deal with uh, a lot of other state agency experts uh, and, and also uh, national ex experts through, uh, you know, various groups. Next slide. Okay, so um, at, a, at a previous meeting, uh, there was a, a list of calm topics. How does GIS and WICD fit in? Uh, the climate change modeling, that's not something that we do uh, in WICD, but it is in, uh, in the WICD uh, working group. And uh, uh, so that, that data is, is starting to become uh, uh, more available in a GIS format. Um, Various collaborative projects. Uh, you need lots of GIS for the base layers. You need to share data. You need the expertise. You 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 kind of get the picture. There's there's uh, uh, lots of uh, uh, field collection that can be done. There's lots of uh, management of the data that needs to be done, and then of course the analysis and the visualization. And and you get a lot of that through uh, what um, Lydia was talking about with the uh, coastal atlas. 
uh, but but again, it's all driven by data, and and uh, and again, it's it's in varying degrees of of completeness and availability. So, uh, next slide, please. Okay, uh, just just to throw in a little plug here uh, for a, a project that I'm I'm working on. Uh, we've, we've been doing uh, LIDAR collections for the last eight years. The next big thing is hydrography uh, through, the, uh, through the USGS program to replace uh, the old 24K uh, hydro that maybe some of you are familiar with or maybe not. Uh, but it is it is the you know basically the uh, the blue lines on the old topo maps. That's that's what what we have now. What we need now is uh, obviously something uh, that's more uh, reflective of current conditions and also uh, local conditions. And we're trying to put together some pilot projects uh, where we collect not only the hydrography but say the the wetlands and high resolution land cover data all at the same time so they actually line up and um, and they're all uh, analysis ready and uh, able to uh, go right into your uh, resiliency projects um, this is sort of a, a new idea because uh, you know most of this data exists in uh, federal agency data silos and we're trying to break those down and um, figure out how to how to uh, do a better job because we we just you know there's a huge need for this and it's uh, expensive and it takes time and we're just not getting enough fast enough so we're we're trying to look at a, a pilot project maybe in the lower fox uh, hydro and culverts is a very important piece of this layer and uh, if you're interested in, in either this area or some other area uh, along the coast, please talk to me because we're, we're trying to get this going. Okay, next slide. Um, so that's, that's kind of, uh, that's my spiel. Um, just a little, I'll, I'll put this in the chat. We, I have a little uh, map that, that shows the, uh, the culvert inventory as it is right now. And uh, I'll put that. Uh, so you could take a look at it and see what's going on. And uh, let's see, I think that's it, right? Any Anything I can answer right away? Yeah, this is a great segue. Thank you, Jim, for talking. Um, we have a question and answer period now. So if you have any questions um, for Jim about WICD or Tori, um, feel free to throw them in the chat or to just raise your hand and um, Adam and Emily will be checking the participant list to see if um, we have anybody with questions. They all want to have a break. <laughs> <laughs> That's coming. <laughs> okay, I, I just put the little uh, data viewer in there. Great. So yeah, for those of you who want to see it in the chat, Jim put a link to the data viewer, um, the culvert inventory data viewer. Yep. Yeah. And there is, so, there is a question from Eric. Yeah. So uh, what type of the attribute data? Um, it's uh, the, the I, I forget the number of attributes, maybe maybe Genevieve can can chime in. It, it's it's a lot. And, and of course, uh, not every inventory is collecting every attribute, but but it is things like the uh, the diameter and the length of the pipe and the type of material and the uh, uh, it was close to like a hundred and sixty. Yeah, it, it's a it's a bunch. It's a lot. <laughs> um, so, uh, and 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 of course, it depends. Uh, you know who is who is doing the inventory. Uh, you know uh, whether it was uh, fish passage information or you know some sort of environmental study or an asset uh, inventory by the the local uh, county road department. Thank you. Um, Teresa had a question in the chat. Uh, what is the preferred way to communicate existing culverts in their area? Oh, that's easy. Talk, talk to Genevieve. <laughs> um, 
there's uh, our, our um, uh, it, it, it it depends a lot on on like like what you what area you, you represent. Uh, are you a, a county? Are you a city? Are you you know a watershed group? Uh, any of those, but but we take take data from any and all of those uh, and put those in the inventory. And it looks like we have a, a question that's going to come from Sherry. Sherry, I'm going to unmute you or ask you to unmute. So. Sure. Yep, I got it. Go. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I work for Marinette County, and I know this summer we want to do a lot of inventory work on our culverts for fish passage reasons. Mm -hmm. Is that something that we would collaborate with you on, or how do you use that kind of data? Yes. Um, this this is this is a good example uh, because there's there's already a lot of uh, good uh, information collected in Marinette County. Uh, I think it's from the uh, Forest Service. Maybe there's a there's a regional uh, culvert inventory called the Great Lakes Stream Crossing Inventory, and our DNR and the Michigan DNR participate in that. And it's uh, it's very much an ecological. Uh, with fish, fish passage is a big part of that. So we can definitely get you in touch with those folks because uh, it, it might save you a lot of time because they've, uh, as I remember the map, they they visit a lot of Marinette County already. So. Okay, that sounds yeah. great. Yeah. Thank you. Jim, I see another question for you from Alan Luloff um, asking if the database includes an in invert elevation uh genevieve do you do you remember uh i don't remember yeah al just what exactly is the invert elevation i'm not a culvert expert just the bottom invert of the culvert elevation so you can tell if it's going to pass how much water it's going to pass and the elevation uh, related to the road so you can know what the bottom invert is okay um so so that would be something you would you would need a uh, uh, you know good gps uh, survey equipment to get that elevation right or if you've got the elevation of the road and you know the difference between, between the, uh, the top of the road and the invert, you can surmise it or derive it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Some, some folks collect that. I'm, I'm sure there's, there's probably a slot in the database for that. And, and it just depends on, you know, who's doing the collecting, whether, whether they're populating that. So. Thanks, Jim. And I just want to make sure you see this note from Aaron in the chat about um, sewer pack um, water restoration plans, um, having inventories of stream crossings that yes. may be able to provide yes. some. Yeah. So yes, we sure definitely want to talk to them. Yes. Great. <laughs> and okay. Then, um, can I answer the last one there? The yes. Okay. From Shannon, so yeah. The, um, uh, uh, state's progress on developing criteria for environmental justice green tool. Glad you asked that. Uh, there is a, a tool in development. It's called WEET for uh, the environmental, uh, Wisconsin Environmental Equity Tool. Uh, it's a collaboration between four state agencies. Uh, and uh, the criteria, uh, which I, I think you mean like the, uh, you know, some of the data layers and the, uh, uh, the index that's, that uh, combines all the layers is out for, well, it was out for bid. Uh, we got uh, like 12 companies that, that bid on it and uh, it's still being decided uh, by um, uh, uh, WEDIC, uh, excuse me, uh, WEDC. Uh, the uh, Economic Development Corporation is the uh, the tool funder, and they are uh, they are deciding who is who is going to be doing that. So we should have yeah we should have <laughs> thanks Mike uh, we should have more info on that soon. But it's a it's a happening thing. Thanks Jim, and Vidya, I see your question in the chat. 
Um, video is curious to know more about how Calm relates to the South e Southeastern Wisconsin Coastal Resilience Project um, and wants to know if it's an expansion, evolution, or separate efforts, and if the Southeastern Wisconsin Coastal Resilience Project website is no longer available. Um, I can provide some clarification here. So this Calm is a separate effort from the Southeastern Wisconsin Coastal Resilience Project. Um, it is a NOAA Project of Special Merit Grant. Um, however, it is kind of an evolution of the Southeastern Wisconsin Coastal Resilience Project. So we're taking um, the success and lesson learned and momentum of what was built with the Southeastern Wisconsin Coastal Resilience Project and um, with CALM are trying to expand that up the coast to improve collaboration and resilience. Um, the website is the same website, it just has a different name and an updated URL. Um, so for those of you who used the Southeastern Wisconsin Coastal Resilience Project website, um, if you look for that, it will just redirect you to the new URL. Um, the name and the URL of the website are just reflecting that the scope of the website has a greater focus now. So it's not specific to Southeastern Wisconsin, it's inclusive of Wisconsin's like all of like their Lake Michigan coastal communities. Um, so the new URL is wisconsinwicoastalresilience.com. Um, there's the same information. Um, it got a bit of a facelift based on some input that we heard from community members. So hopefully there's improved access um, and navigation throughout the site as well. And Emily put the link in the chat. Thank you, Emily. Okay, so with that, I don't see any other questions. Um, let's take a five minute break. Um, feel free to grab coffee, stretch your legs, answer those emails, and we will see you back here at 1116. So thank you very much. And so one, one theme of the uh, wiki report overall is is we're experiencing and anticipate to continue experiencing a warmer and wetter climate in Wisconsin. And so on the left is just uh, annual temperature in, by decade from the 1890s to the 2010s. Um, and you can see the 2000s and 2010s were the warmest decades on record and we, we, you know that's anticipated to continue into the future. Um, Similarly, uh, wetter climate, you can see precipitation on the right organized by decades um, from the 1890s to 2010s. And uh, I think we've all sort of experienced this, the 2010s being the wettest decade uh, by far in recorded history. And so warmer and wetter doesn't necessarily translate exactly to what the coastal impacts might be. Um, next. And so in our coastal resilience report, we wanted to look at some of these Great Lakes coastal climate stressors and sort of uh, kind of um, explain or describe how these things might be changing in a, in a warmer climate. So one is uh, wave energy. Uh, that's a big impact to our coasts. Those waves are the ones that sort of do the erosion. They're the force behind moving uh, our coastal sediments and, and sort of acting on our shorelines. Uh, all, as well as uh, sort of bringing water up and, and flooding our communities. Uh, those storms are strongest in the winter, as many of you know. Um, next. And, and those waves are really uh, interact with our ice cover on the Great Lakes. Um, so ice cover can act as a buffer to our shorelines to, to keep wave energy from hitting the coast, as well as give less open water in the winter for those waves to develop. Uh, next. And, and of course, uh, a big one that we're all familiar with from the last few years is water levels that uh, really can control how those waves act and uh, really the nature of our coast. Next, um, when we see high water levels like we're coming out of, uh, those waves get further up the shoreline and can uh, really readily cause coastal erosion, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, as well as in our low lying areas, coastal flooding. Next. Um, our important shipping industry in Wisconsin, however, for the most part, likes when water levels are higher because uh, ships can carry more cargo uh, without uh, concerns about depths in our ports. Um, so it really is a boon for our shippers for the most part, unless damage is caused to our coastal infrastructure. Next. 
And on the other end of the extreme, when we have our extreme low water levels, uh, our beaches widen up. Erosion is less of a concern, although not uh, totally out of mind. Uh, shipping industry and, and boating industry is pretty pressed because those water depths in our ports and marinas become more problematic and maybe you need to do increasing dredging and things like that. So these were sort of the main uh, climate stressors we looked at in our report and I'll kind of talk about them and the anticipated climate impacts next. Uh, so historic water levels, this is something again I'm sure a lot of you have seen uh, the water levels on the Great Lakes over the past uh, 100 plus years of record. Um, Lake Superior on the top and Lake Michigan Huron on the bottom. Uh, Lake Michigan Huron mentioned as one lake because they're connected through the Straits of Mackinac and have essentially the same water level. I've highlighted a few things in red. Uh, that's our recent uh, prolonged low water level period uh, culminating in a record low in January of 2013. And then of course, our recent high water period, dramatic change from that low up to record highs in 2020. Um, we're kind of back down to around average at this point, um, but really we've seen uh, throughout history, uh, going from extreme highs and extreme lows, something that uh, definitely needs to be accounted for on our Great Lakes coasts. Next, uh, looking into the future, uh, what are water levels going to do? Uh, one, one thing we need to consider for what those water levels are gonna do is, well, how does water enter and exit the Great Lakes? So I've, I've got uh, Lake Michigan here on here, uh, precipitation onto the lake surface, runoff into the lake and evaporation of water from the lake surface are the main uh, inputs of water into the lake as well as main way water leaves the lakes. And so those first three components uh, are termed net basin supply. So our precipitation plus our runoff minus the water leaving through evaporation. That really by and large is what drives those lake level variations. Um, water also enters and leaves the lakes uh, through connecting channels. So for Lake Michigan, we have the St. Mary's flowing in from Lake Superior and the St. Clair River flowing out of Lake Huron and into Lake Erie. Uh, we also have diversions of water into and out of the lake system. Uh, in Lake Michigan, that's, that happens in Chicago where the Chicago River was reversed from at one time flowing into Lake Michigan and now flowing out into the Mississippi Basin. Um, thinking about climate change impacts, next. Uh, warmer and wetter climate, um, that is gonna change some of these variables. So a wetter climate will bring more precipitation and more runoff into the lake but our warmer climate is likely to drive increased evaporation from the lake surface. So this makes understanding what's gonna happen with water levels a bit uh, uncertain because we have both our inputs and our outputs increasing. Um, and it, at this point, it's not clear uh, if there will be a clear winter uh, driving lake levels up or down. Um, prior, the prior wiki report, the consensus was we were gonna see a downward trend in lake levels. Um, some changes in, in understanding an error and how runoff was sort of accounted for has brought more uncertainty into that. There's some uh, studies that indicate roughly similar net basin supply or slight increase or slight decrease. And so um, right now uh, it is uncertain what we'll see in the future, um, but we expect to continue to see extreme highs and extreme lows uh, going forward. And that's something we should plan for. Um, because these inputs and outputs are intensifying uh, in a changing climate, there may be higher highs and lower lows and possibly quicker changes between those. So these are all things, you know, at this point we need to be preparing for in a changing climate. Uh, next. A uh, little bit easier to anticipate is what's happening with ice cover. Over our period of record from the 70s till now, uh, we've seen a decline in ice cover and that correlates really uh, strongly with our warming temperatures. Um, it's, it's harder to form ice cover uh, in both the sort of maximum extent across the lakes as well as the duration that ice cover forms on our lakes. And so we anticipate to see that continue into the future. Um, next, what have we seen in terms of wave energy on the lakes? This is a recent study out of Michigan Tech that looked at wave energy trends in Lake Michigan. Um, on the left is mean wave energy. The middle is the highest 10% of waves and the far right is the highest 1% of waves. So those extreme waves. And the colors, red shows where there's been observed a decreasing trend in wave energy 
blue shows an increasing trend in wave energy. And so the takeaway here is there really hasn't been a consistent trend observed in wave energy reaching our coasts uh, over the last 40 years. Uh, it's gone up and it's gone down, um, but it hasn't shown a widespread trend. Uh, next, but into the future, as I mentioned, with ice cover declining, that could potentially expose us to more wave energy reaching the coast. And that's really illustrated uh, in this comparison between a low ice year of 2013 and a high ice year of 2014 on the bottom. So that first column of, of plots of Lake Michigan shows the ice cover in those two years, the darker blue being lower ice cover. So you can really see the dramatic difference in ice cover between those two successive years. The middle plot is the wind speed over the lakes in those two years. Uh, the takeaway there being these were roughly similar wind speed years. So similar amount of potential to make wave energy on the lakes. Uh, and then that, that far right column is the actual wave energy averaged on the lake over those two years. And you can see a pretty marked, marked difference between the low ice year having a much higher wave energy represented by that darker red uh, compared to the high ice year. And so really underscoring the impacts of ice on the lakes and how it translates to wave energy. Next. And so to take this a little bit further, the researchers did a hypothetical. What if we had no ice on the lakes during, during both those years? And so that really brought basically similar wave energy on the lakes in that hypo hypothetical uh, scenario. So comparing that high ice year of 2014, it was about a 50% increase in wave energy between the actual high ice conditions and if there was no ice on the lakes. So uh, again, that tie between potential declines in ice cover is, and potential increases in wave energy uh, sort of illustrated here. Next. So kind of in summary for climate change impacts, uh, those variables, water levels continue to expect variability and extremes that we've seen, uh, decline in ice cover and a corresponding increase in wave energy. Uh, that can lead, will prob you know, prob probably lead to increased coastal flooding, infrastructure damage and coastal erosion going forward. Um, and then in terms of our shipping capacity, you know, continuing to see extreme lows uh, may hinder shipping. Um, but, but a loss of ice cover on the lakes could open that shipping season up a little bit more um, throughout the year, not having to shut down uh, when, when the lakes are ice covered. Next. So um, adaptation strategies for, for this and, and for coastal issues and coastal hazards in general, um, there, there's sort of too many to cover in this, this uh, one presentation, but just wanted to highlight a few uh, from our report is considering function at all lake levels. Um, we expect to keep seeing highs and lows and, and just being cognizant that uh, when water levels are low, we're likely to see high lake levels again. When water levels are high, we're gonna see lows again and considering uh, the, that variability when we take action on the coast. Coordinating actions along the coast, um, this is a great example of that, getting together and talking about these issues and finding areas where we can um, learn from each other and work together. Uh, locating homes away from eroding shorelines, we expect that erosion to continue and, and possibly increase. So having uh, ordinances that factor in erosion and uh, bluff failure, as well as uh, perhaps some uncertainty, a little buffer uh, if, is a way to, to be more resilient. And then working with natural processes to protect the coast. Uh, Nature-based solutions are sort of growing an in interest in the Great Lakes. This is an example of a steel sheet pile wall in Marysville, Michigan that was uh, transformed into a sill, a rock sill with sort of a layer of rock, uh, some vegetation, and then some rock on the shoreline. Still offering protection among different water levels, but adding a, a more beautiful shoreline, one that has habitat and one that can be more accessible. Uh, next. So, um, we have a lot of resources about adaptation strategies, this adapting to a changing coast series for property owners, as well as local officials is available uh, on the website, as well as next. Um, some more detailed dives into a property owner's guide to protecting your bluff, as well as examples of these nature-based solutions in the Great Lakes. Next. So for you know, more information on climate change impacts to the coast, as well as Wisconsin as a whole, uh, I encourage you to visit the wiki website um, that's in the chat and next.
Uh, just would like to thank you and acknowledge uh, all the contributors to this Wiki Coastal Resilience Working Group report. Um, DNR, Coastal Management, UW, Ozaki County, ASFPM, USGS, all contributed. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Adam. Um, again, we're going to have another question and answer period. So if you have any questions for Adam, um, you know, type them in the chat or hold them until um, the Q and A in a little bit. Um, I'm going to quickly uh, go back to our coastal states organization slide, um, and I will introduce our next speaker, Rachel Keelan, um, from the coastal states organization. And she's going to provide an overview of the Infrastructure Investment and Job Act and what relevant coastal appropriations will be um, for the resilience work happening in this region. Um, so thank you, Rachel, for being here. I'm just pulling up your slides and then I'll let you take it away. All right, it's all yours. All right, thank you for having me today. Um, so I'm just going to do a little bit of a overview of the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act with an eye specifically to coastal appropriations. So next slide. Um, IIJA or Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act was enacted in November 2021. And it was, um, it's basically supplemental appropriations for FY22 funding through um, mostly 2026, but there's a little bit of variability there. Um, the length of time that that funding is available for kind of varies across the different agencies. So particularly for NOAA, um, it's 2022 to 2026. Um, and that is two-year funds. So that means that they kind of have to spend it each year's worth in two years. And then some of the other agencies have um, the same uh, through 2026, but they actually have it available until expended. So that money could last decades into the future, but hopefully they will spend it sooner. Um, Army Corps has immediately avail available all of the funding. So they can start kind of putting all of their money straight to the projects right now. Um, the White House has released a guidebook, um, and there is also a really good searchable um, data set uh, that corresponds with the guidebook that has uh, lots of information on timing, on when the various different funding is being released for um, uh, grants and stuff when you, when you can apply. So I believe that has been added in the chat box. Next slide. Um, so we are moving to the implementation phase. We have a couple of updates here. Army Corps of Engineers has finalized and it's been finalized for a while. There are various different work plans, whereas NOAA is a little bit further behind. They have submitted spend plans to Congress and we are awaiting approval on that. As soon as that's approved, NOAA will be able to move forward with putting out RFPs, um, and we'll start seeing money going out the door. There are a couple of things underneath the um, IIJA that are also formula allocated, and some of those have already started to be dispersed to the states. And we'll touch on a couple of those a little bit later. Next slide. So, this is just a quick overview of various different NOAA coastal appropriations. Um, for coastal zone management. Obviously very important is the Coastal Zone Management Act um, under some of the sections on technical assistance and at the Coastal and Estuarine Land Conservation Fund. There's 207 million that's available there. Also through the NEARS, there's 77 million. Um, these are both for habitat restoration projects. There's lots of other habitat restoration funding, including under the National Coastal Resilience Fund, the NOAA Office for Habitat Conservation, um, their kind of habitat restoration grants. Um, we see a lot of funding for NOAA under um, restoring fish passageways and um, funding for observations, marine debris removal, et cetera. Um, there is a little bit of funding in there that's also for kind of um, 
foundational operations for regional ocean partnerships. So that's an interesting addition to this one. Next slide. Under EPA, there is one billion for Great Lakes, uh, the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, and um, 132 million for the National Estuaries or estuary programs, and that's kind of divided across the various different NEPs. Um, there's also a um, clean water state revolving loan that has some um, infrastructure, coastal infrastructure components to it. Um, and then there is uh, funding allocated for specific geographic programs, none of which are in the Great Lakes. Um, next slide. And FEMA also got funding, specifically a billion for pre-disaster mitigation assistance, um, 500 million for hazard mitigation revolving loan fund, and um, 3.5 billion for the um, NFIP fund. So next slide. And under Army Corps, so there's a lot of various different funds under Army Corps that can be used for, um, different coastal projects. Um, some of them are highlighted here and some of them are for projects and some of it is for studies. Um, and so there is some availability potentially for some of it to be used for, there was some potential for some of it to be used for the Great Lakes Resilience Study. However, that was not selected under um, the work plans as one of the things under the studies. Um, so they do have um, 2.55 billion for coastal storm risk management, hurricane storm damage. There's um, 251 million for flood control and coastal emergencies, um, three, 30 million for planning assistance to states and tribes. So there's a lot that's in here. Um, large amounts that are available. Next slide. So DOI also has some tribal funding available. There's um, funding both for adaptation planning and um, community relocation. Um, and these are all kind of in that climate resilience category. Um, so that is DOI, next slide. And this one is an interesting one. The Department of Transportation um, has not only an authorization or not only an appropriation, but also an authorization in the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. So um, basically they have authorized the promoting resilient operation for transformative, efficient and cost savings transportation or project for short, much shorter. Um, and this is grants to states and local agencies. And there's kind of a split in how this is going out. So part of it is going out to states in a formula. The larger portion of that is going out to the states, 7.3 billion. Um, and then 1.4 billion is going out in competitive grants. And this is really um, focused on uh, resilient infrastructure, transportation infrastructure with a specific call out for um, transportation infrastructure in the coastal zone. So there's, this is an interesting new -er pot of funding that is available. Next slide. Um, there is also um, a new authorization under NOAA for um, under the Outer Continental Shelf Land Act. They have amended it to allow um, leasing easements rights and rights of way for essentially the injection of um, carbon dioxide into the sea floor. So that's just kind of an interesting new authorization that's in there. Next slide. So looking forward, um, we at CSO are looking at advancing messaging that IIJA is um, supplemental funding. Um, so it is supplemental to annual appropriations. It does not replace annual appropriations and that there is still continuing to be needs for increases in annual appropriations. Um, we also are looking at continued support for Build Back Better or other kind of similar vehicles for advancing the various different coastal resilience provisions that were in the Build Back Better bill or the reconciliation bill, um, noting that uh, just 
in the last day or so. Uh, so that has been stalled for a little bit, but just in the last day or so, Senator Manchin, who had been um, kind of stalling that, is uh, signaling willingness to negotiate. So there is potentially some room for uh, build back better or a revised version of that to get moving again. And so there's lots of potentially great coastal resilience provisions in there as well that we should all keep our eyes on. And that is it. Next slide. Any questions? And I think we have a question and answer time a little bit later. Yep, we do. Thank you, Rachel. Um, so if you do have questions, feel free to throw them in the chat now. Um, Emily will take, a, she'll log those for later. Otherwise, um, Rachel can answer, can answer any questions um, during the Q&A period. Um, so up next, we have um, Shannon from American Rivers, who is here to talk to us um, about some upcoming workshops about stormwater infrastructure funding um, and financing uh, opportunities or financing approaches, excuse me. So I'm just going to pull up her slides here and then I will let her take it away. Well, while you're getting those up, I can at least say thank you for inviting me and allowing me to listen. Um, it's very exciting to just be a part of this new kind of collaborative that you're forming. Um, and I just applaud all of you for taking time and out in your very busy days to even embark on one of the collaborations. It's very exciting. I'm yeah, Shannon Myers. I'm, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was gonna say thank you and uh, your slides are up, so feel free to take it away. Sure, thanks. I'm Shannon Byers. I'm an economist at American Rivers. And for those that aren't familiar, American Rivers is a national environmental conservation organization working to restore the health of rivers and watersheds in our community and in our communities and advocate for clean water priorities at the state and federal levels. Um, in collaboration with our local partners and municipal leaders, our team explores funding and financing st strategies capable of supporting green stormwater infrastructure programs and other coastal resilience solutions. I'm actually located across Lake Michigan and Grand Rapids, but we're getting ready to launch a stormwater credit trading program this summer here. We're very excited about that aims to incentivize green stormwater implementations on private properties. But over the last two years, American Rivers and our partners, Water Now Alliance and One Water Econ, worked alongside communities in Wisconsin and across the country to try to overcome some of the hurdles and explore funding for green storm water infrastructure investments. So building on this experience um, with support from local funders, we're collaborating with the Lakeshore Natural Resource Partnership and Water 365 to provide these funding and financing approaches that are relevant to the small and mid-sized um, Lakeshore communities in Wisconsin. Um, so our collective team hopes to deliver a series of workshops this spring to the LNRP partner communities to help explore these financing strategies uh, for what they mean to your, your communities. We'll have three workshops that will provide the municipal leaders and water resource managers, community leaders with some practical knowledge about these approaches and funding the climate resilient initiatives. Uh, the workshops are going to cover a lot of topics, uh, debt financing, incentivizing private property green infrastructure implementations, accessing state and federal programs, like thank you, Rachel, the state revolving um, loan funds and all those appropriations we see coming out of IIJ, how can you get to them? And we're trying to follow where that money is coming down to state and community levels. Um, we want to explore intersections with you between um, environmental and social vulnerabilities and where those exist to help strategize the funding that could not only um, offer you opportunities to your water to quality improvements or your coastal resilience see, um, goals, but also broader community goals. And we'll dive into even more. And the participating communities will be encouraged to develop their own funding and financing strategies linked to current priority projects as well as future community needs. And many other municipalities that we'll be working with have identified these priority projects and a separate but complementary project with the Great Lakes St. Lawrence Cities Initiative and LNRP um, so far this year. So we'll, we've been listening in on those conversations, we're learning and we're just getting ready to dive a little deeper. 
Um, currently, the participation in this series for the spring will be by invitation only. That's just to ensure that the participants from the communities have space for open discussion. Um, however, all the resources, including recorded webinars, will be available on a Funding for Coastal Resiliency website, which will kind of store this information for you. Um, we will share it abroad, of course. Um, if you can learn more about our partners and the financing approaches, kind of the work we've developed so far at the tapandwaternow.org website and stormwatercurrency.com, I can post those in the chat if they're not coming up. Um, the participating communities would have already received an email invitation, so check your inbox. Um, you should be listed on the slide. Um, if not, we'll be sending out uh, more invitations this week. Um, if you are, repre are representing one of those communities and you haven't seen an invitation from LNRP, um, please reach out to me or LNRP and we'll make sure that we get you those links. Um, right now, anyone's open to go at least look at that resource and dive into, um, or look at the website and dive into some of the resources that we have available right now. Um, and we hope that we expand our shared understanding and we can help share with other Wisconsin communities. So if you're interested in participating, uh, maybe in the future or just receiving on updates and our process, just drop us a line. And thank you for allowing me to visit and participate today. Thank you, Shannon. So um, the resources that Shannon mentioned are all been uh, have been added to the chat, so you can check out the resource website um, as well as a couple other links and um, her contact information is also there. Um, so our last presenter this morning is Frank Shockey from Federal Emergency Management Agency. And in light of um, the new and upcoming releases of the uh, updated flood insurance studies and flood insurance rate maps, um, the uh, DNR and FEMA will be hosting several floodplain management trainings. And so Frank is going to tell us a bit about those opportunities this morning. And Frank, if you're on, feel free to unmute yourself and, and start your video. Can you hear me now? Yep, we can hear you. Okay, I had the double mute thing going on with my phone. Um, hi folks, my name is Frank Shockey. I'm a senior floodplain management specialist at FEMA Region 5 in Chicago. Um, as some of you may have heard, uh, FEMA has been embarked on a multi-year, almost multi-decade project to map coastal flood hazards along the Great Lakes shorelines. Uh, we've kind of been progressing westward through the lakes, and we've been working on Lake Michigan recently in some of the counties in, in uh, Michigan and Wisconsin, Indiana, and Illinois have gotten these maps already, and um, they're approaching what we would consider the regulatory phase of the process, which is where they become official, begin to be used by local communities for land use regulation. Uh, recognizing that some of the zones, the coastal high hazard areas that would be identified on these maps, some of the data that's associated with that mapping, uh, it's expected to be used for floodplain management activities in the areas that are affected by flood hazards, uh, is a little unfamiliar, unfamiliar to Wisconsin and Michigan and Illinois and Indiana zoning administrators and land use regulators. Um, we've created a, a kind of a half day seminar uh, to get people up to speed on how to apply floodplain management regulations in these areas. Uh, the basics of what's required by the NFIP's minimum standards that are gonna be incorporated into local ordinances or in Michigan, the Michigan State Building Code, uh, and how to find the data in our flood insurance studies and flood hazard uh, maps that you would use for regulating these areas. So uh, in Wisconsin, we've, we've done this in the past, but it was several years ago and kind of in advance of these maps coming out. Uh, but as some of these maps are coming into the regulatory process and others are kind of being unveiled to start the regulatory process, uh, we're, we're gonna be offering a couple more of these workshops coming in May. Uh, the first one will be on May 24th in the morning in Port Washington at the Ozaukee County Administration Building. The second one will be on May 25th, that's a Wednesday, at uh, the UW Green Bay Extension Facility, the STEM Innovation Center. Uh, if you'd like me to uh, 
you'd like to get in contact with me to sign up to attend one of those, uh, I'm going to put my email address in the chat. I can give you the details on the locations and the time to get you signed up. Um, oh, somebody put my email address in the chat for me. Thank you very much. You can email me and I'll keep you in, uh, in the loop on the location and exact times uh, if you'd like to attend one of those. Uh, if you're not interested in attending, but you know folks in coastal communities that are in uh, Wisconsin, Lake Michigan counties, including Green Bay, that have a hand in land use regulation that could stand to learn about this sort of thing, by all means, pass the information on to them because we'd like to have as many people attend this as possible. Uh, we recognize that one or two webinars once or twice in this process isn't gonna be enough. There's gonna be an ongoing, ongoing need for education. Um, at any rate, if people have questions in advance of that, they can contact me as well. So once again, that's May 24th and May 25th in Ozaukee County and Fort Washington and in Green Bay and Brown County respectively. And uh, if you have other questions about what sort of content is gonna be included, uh, I guess you can ask those questions during our little question and answer period. Thanks again, and I appreciate uh, the opportunity to spread this word about this. Thank you, Frank. Um, I really appreciate you sharing that with us today. Um, and so now we will have a another Q&A period. So um, any questions you may have for um, Adam, Rachel, Shannon, or Frank, um, now's the time to ask them. I saw that Shannon already got a question in the chat, but it looks like she answered it. So feel free to raise your hand, um, unmute, or type something in the chat if you have any questions. I will just say that um, all of our speakers have shared their contact information today. If you scroll through the chat, it's in there. So if you do think of anything um, or have any specific questions um, that come to mind, uh, feel free to reach out to them. Um, and you know, it, it's been great to have them all here today. Um, I don't see any questions coming in. So I'm just going to um, wrap up and say a big thank you to everyone who was here. Um, this morning, all of our speakers, as well as those of you who attended. Um, it's been a long time planning, and I know a lot of you have heard about it before. Some of you just got invitations today, um, but it's really exciting to um, finally kick off this Calm Network. Um, our next network meeting um, will be this summer, likely June, so stay tuned for an announcement for that. Um, and we're excited to just continue engaging with you to find oppor opportunities to share tools and resources, case studies and funding opportunities with this network. Um, and we're especially looking forward to leveraging your uh, experiences, your expertise to find those opportunities for you to share and collaborate with one another. Um, so if you have any ideas for that for future meetings or even um, more local meetings, um, please share them with me, reach out at any time. Um, I would love to hear them. Um, on that note, I just want to remind you that we will be sending out a monthly Coastal Resilience newsletter. Um, those of you who are already on the mailing list should have gotten that this morning. Um, please check the Collaboration Classified section of the newsletter to see what's going on within the region um, and if there's opportunities to share information or lessons learned with one another. Um, if you have something that you would like to uh, the network's input in, or on, excuse me, um, send it to me and I will help you get it added to the newsletter. Um, if you forget my email, no worries, my contact information um, will be on the newsletter. Um, you can also use the contact us form on the website. Um, so feel free to reach out to me directly or use the contact form. Um, and that brings me to just my second reminder. Um, you can browse our website for coastal resilience resources. We're continually developing content for the website. Um, so keep checking back for new blog posts, new information, new opportunities. Um, and if you wanna sign up for the newsletter, you can do that on the website. It was great to see you all this morning. Enjoy the rest of your Wednesday. Thanks, Lydia.
You're welcome. Thanks for being here, Tori.